Hello, you little legends. I'm Dom Harvey, and this is my podcast, Runners Only, with Dom Harvey, the first official episode, and shit, I am nervous. <laughs> um, first of all, can I say uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. If you've listened to one of the um, teaser episodes or trailer episodes that I've posted in the last couple of weeks, and thank you for the uh, the kind comments as well. The response has been, um, I don't know if it's necessarily deserved, but it's been um, truly humbling. It really has, because I've honestly got no idea what I'm doing here. I am, with my broadcasting history, uh, familiar and comfortable with talking into a microphone, but in the past I've had no interest or no need to learn any of the tech side of anything I'm doing, Um, so this has been a whole new ball game. (laughs) <laughs> and there's bound to be a lot of stuff ups on the way and I'm, I'm excited about that and um, part of me is excited about having you guys along for that ride as well. A couple of thank yous, I need to thank um, my good friend, one of my old radio producers, Carl Thompson, who um, also has a podcast himself that you should check out called Married, Divorced and Dating. He has been instrumental in getting me up and running. He, uh, When I told him I wanted to do a podcast, he, um, he gave me a list of equipment I needed to buy and he's helped me every step of the way and there have been a lot of calls and a lot of FaceTimes. <laughs> So when I say every step of the way, there have, have been a lot of steps, like a sky tower amount of steps. So, Carl, thank you so much. Actually, um, yeah, other podcasters as well. There's um, James Marshall, who does What a Lad, uh, Tana Rumanga, who's got a fantastic podcast as well. Anyone in the podcasting community that you ask for um, sort of help, assistance, feedback or whatever, everyone is so kind and so generous and so willing to help. And that's really cool. I'm really humbled by that. I do apologise if it sounds like I'm overstating this, but um, I suffer from this um, condi- it's really weird, this condition called imposter syndrome. It's an actual thing where you're just always waiting to be caught out because you don't think you don't think you're worthy. It's it's really really weird. It's um it's a just a nasty brain thing. But yeah, maybe you feel the same. Maybe you um also have imposter syndrome and you never knew it had a name. But if you're curious about it, yeah, look it up. It's an actual thing. All right. Here we go, the first official podcast, Runners Only with Dom Harvey. Today's guest, a good friend of mine, New Zealand singer-songwriter, absolute legend of a man, Mitch James. You might know his song, um, Sunday Morning. Uh, God, he goes so many other bangers as well. Look them up on Spotify if you're not familiar with who Mitch James is. But as well as that, he's a marathon runner, ran his first marathon in Auckland a few weeks ago, did a cracking time as well. And um, you won't believe under what circumstances he did it. I guarantee he was the only person in the Auckland Marathon that did this particular pre-race thing that he did. Before we get into that, any feedback you've got when you get to the end of it, um, I'd love it. Any guest suggestions you've got? Has this podcast been too long? Is there any optimum length? Any sort of feedback you've got, because I'm sort of punching my way through the dark here, and I want to grow this thing as a community with you guys, and I appreciate you being here at Step 1 along for the journey with me. All right, here we go. Theme music. Hey, runners only, yeah, yeah, let's get it started. Hey, hey. This is Runners Only with Dom Harley. Fast paced, slow and steady, anywhere you coming. Just want to connect for everyone who loves running. This is Runners Only. Yeah, let's get it started. This is Runners Only with Dom Harley. Fast paced, slow and steady, anywhere you coming. Just want to connect for everyone who loves running. Hey, Runners Only with Dom Harley. Sitting here with Mitch James, who just listened to the theme. Yeah. Mitch James, by the way, singer songwriter, one of New Zealand's finest. Um, what did you think of the theme song, mate? No, I was pleasantly surprised. I was pleasantly <laughs> surprised. I was actually expecting because we talked about it was a fiver sort of job, and I was expecting hell on earth. But yeah, not bad for eighty bucks. Thanks very much. Could you do better? Absolutely, I could have, but it might cost you a little bit more than eighty bucks. <laughs> hey, so how are you? I'm good, man. I'm yeah. very good. I'm very good. And yeah, like I said off air, like. I saw you message me and I actually saw the podcast for the first time about an hour or two before and I was like, I'll hit you up. Like, I, I, I want to be on here and, and have a chat about running and some stuff that people usually probably wouldn't ask. So, yeah. Yeah, because you um, just recently um, ran the Auckland Marathon, your first, uh, yes. your debut marathon. Yeah. Um, how did you get on? Yeah, I, I did. I, I originally set the goal for four hours and... Um, I kind of realised I was making pretty good progress, and so set it for a three thirty um, target, and yeah, ended up doing three hours twenty eight f- fifteen. I think right was. for a, yeah. a debut marathon, actually for any marathon, that's flying. That's a really good pace. That's sub five minute five minute k pace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it was an experience. Like my mum had, uh, mum and dad had both run marathons, and um, they've both been sick, so it was sort of a way for me to 
to honour them, um, which was real cool, and mum came up for it. Um, Dad was a bit too crook, but yeah, for them to be there, and um, I got the warning about the last hitting the wall and everything, whatever, mum. <laughs> like, real. Yeah, fuck it's real. It's yeah, um, it yeah, real. I must admit, when I invited you on the podcast, um, I didn't know that you had been running. I didn't know what your association with running was, but I just mm. remember you coming in to, to, to see me at the edge in places, and I've mm. talked about you and your mum your mum before and her running. Yeah. So, so she was a runner growing up. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm not sure when she discovered the fire for it, but she she would have been young. And um, yeah, she's she's fun size, she's tiny, and so she's, um, yeah, not much uh, weight to carry around, so she just sort of flew around the streets wherever she was for, for years. I think she won the Invercargill Marathon and held the record there for a Shit. while. Um, but yeah, she was always sort of there or thereabouts for, for um, New Zealand women. Yeah. And and um, you said their their health's not good at the moment. What's going on there? Uh, mum mum's doing okay at the moment, but she uh, she's been battling melanoma. Oh. Um, Dad's got a bit of uh, prostate cancer, which has spread a little bit, so he's um, he's battling through. But yeah, like I said, it was a real cool way to to honour them. And then in the in the midst of it all, I uh, definitely caught the bug. Wow. Well, so what's next? You're going to do another one? You want to get that time down? Or are you just yeah. going to keep running for fitness? And well, so I, I, I've, I've finished. I think it was something like 149th, and um, I realised without my uh, toilet breaks, which we'll probably get into <laughs> later on, that I would have, I would have been something like 120th. And there's just something inside me that wants to finish in a top 100 of, of, of a marathon. So I think that's probably next. So the, the, the top 100 in the Auckland Marathon, did you work out what time you need to make top 100? Uh, yeah, I think it wasn't even to... I think there was an influx around like 3.20 that mm-hmm. came through. So yeah. I probably need, to, probably need to take, yeah, 10 or so minutes off it. But um, yeah, I mean, I can't stop. I, I start, My chiropractor was like, you need to take a month off running and I think it was four days after the marathon where I had the <laughs> started hitting the pavement again. Yeah. So when did you decide to do that? And how do you the, the, the marathon, marathon? And how did you, how do you fit it in with all your your music commitments? So um, yeah, I think I, I would have started like I've always sort of ran like when I'm in good fitness habits. I like it wouldn't have been a focus in the past, but it always sort of been there or thereabouts. And then um, yeah, I, I broke up with my my ex partner, and I. Had nothing to do, so like, I like uh, again COVID as a musician, you know, like there's fuck all to do. Like you know, there's only so many songs you can write and no no gigs to play. So, um, you know, I I was a bit of a sad sack at the time. So I figured, you know, I always feel better after a run, and and five k's ends up turning into forty two five months later. Yeah, that's amazing, mate. That is so amazing. And um, yeah, three twenty-eight. Some people spend their entire life like trying to break four hours, you know. Yeah. So yeah. you go out there and smash three thirty in your first bastard. run. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, do, 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 did you get recognised on course, or do you get recognised much um, when you're training? I think it's it's hard to say. Like New Zealanders. Are, um, oh, okay, gotcha. So it, people might give you a look, but not necessarily. Yeah, say you know this, right? Yeah. You know, you, you. I'm sure it's. Probably the exact same as you when you go for a run. You get the old double take, and or well, like when you're walking down the street, you hear this with the whispers as you as you go. But um, and then yeah. when you walk away, merch. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Um, but there was uh, there was one um, there was one lovely lady on the uh, a volunteer who was. Uh, who sort of blew my cover, <laughs> which was funny. I thought I had a pretty clean race going through, and then um, as we got through town. Uh, this um, lovely lady, he's like, Mitch James, Mitch James, oh, go Mitch James. And then I start hearing the whole volunteer group go, oh, Mitch James, there you go. But, um, yeah, no. Uh, they could have been more creative. The run was literally on a Sunday morning. Right? Yeah, yeah, well, literally, <laughs> there you go. There you go. But, yeah, I mean, no, I, I think it's, yeah, you probably know it's the uh, the double looks. You kind of know when yeah, someone yeah, knows. Yeah. It's like the sixth sense, yeah. One, one thing I noticed when I was whenever, whenever I was out with um, JJ when we were still together, mm. She's really good at picking up on when people are giving her the look, yeah. and she'll be proactive and go over and say hi to them. I I don't do that myself. That's very you, JJ, isn't it? Yeah. I, I'm 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 the same as you. Like unless I'm boozed up, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I I I find it just uh, yeah, it's, it's a little it's a little weird. But there's some, I guess there's two types of people, right? There's the um, there's the and, and the people like JJ who just love. Just the the interaction with people and 
and then there's the people like me who just kind of want to hide away in the corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yo, you said you had quite a few toilet um, breaks in the first half of the marathon. <laughs> yeah. What's the uh, What's the yeah. go there? Yeah, so so uh, mum, they, they um they, they are very expensive on the time when you oh, get to the finish yeah, line. Oh yeah, 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 big time. Um, so my mum, <laughs> my mum came up for the race and she's like, oh, "You got a carb load? You got a carb load?" She's like, nothing but carbs all day. It's like, this sounds a bit weird, but okay. And so I bought an air fryer. <laughs> I bought an air fryer, slammed in the Kuma chips all day, all night. And um, woke up at 5.30, not a morning person. Like, typically, like, I'll wake up. Whenever I wake up, I'll um, indulge in a little bit of cannabis. And I'll, <laughs> I'll go for my run on my time. But 5.30 a.m., mum's there. I'm flustered as shit. I don't know what's going on. She's like, get in the car now. We're going to be late. You're going to miss the start. So, I, obviously, in there, there wasn't time to go to the toilet. Um, and little did I know, I have I have a day's worth of camera backlogged somewhere. <laughs> um, and so then I uh, I get, and we're on the motorway, 5.30, no one's there, and we're kind of racing there. I'm like, mum, like, fuck, like, this is problematic and so luckily there's some port lose at the start and so whew, okay we're good finish uh start line five minutes to go let's go all right bang and then about 10 15 minutes and i was like oh fuck oh, there's more yeah <laughs> oh, there, yeah there's more and i don't think uh i think well probably fair enough they don't put much port lose on the in the front a little bit because not everyone's a fucking idiot yeah, like okay. me. <laughs> and so I was holding on, get to the first <laughs> toilets. And I was like, whoo, shit, okay. And then the sort of same thing happened up until about the halfway mark. And I think it was four or five stops. And then, um, then yeah, we were all clear. All, <laughs> runway was <laughs> runway was clear and, um, yeah, no more stops. But, um, yeah, thanks, mum. The, the marathon winner, the, the know-it-all. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, because when, when your mum was racing, it was probably um, like a really, really big thing. I think nutritionists have sort of um, said you don't need as many. There used to be like pasta parties. Yeah, so you go to a yeah, marathon yeah. event and the night before, yeah, there'd be like a pasta party where people yeah. just have, you know, load up on carbs with pasta as much as you can. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised, but... Yeah, to be fair, I think mum's knowledge is probably stuck in the 1980s. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And what about, um, what about on course? Did you have any gels or anything like that? Had a, had a few gels, yeah. So I, I experimented, I think, about 10 or 12 days out with like a long one, like I think 33Ks I went and um, tried out the gels then and... The first one I had, I was like, oh, fuck they are gross. fucking disgusting. Yeah, eh? yeah. Awful. You need water. Put it that way. <laughs> Put it that way. So I figured that one out. Slowly got that down. I was like, oh, fuck, I need water. And you know that feeling when, um, you know, like there's too much sugar in you and you want to vomit, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but like your body stops it. Had that. But then after that first one, I've just, I felt good, eh? I felt mm. good and felt like I could do it. Um, that last 10Ks, I was like, yeah, I got this. One more energy gel on that last 10Ks. Uh, I'll be sweet, and um, boy, was I fucking wrong. But yeah, they, uh, that, I had them, and um, yeah, just the shit they gave you on course. I yeah, found it yeah. so strange that they uh, gave you flat coke. But um, apparently oh, that stuff's normal. like petrol. Yeah, yeah, that's stuff in the last yeah last Literally. half hour of a run. Oh yeah, don't yeah. yeah. In future, always take the flat coke. Yeah, shit. Yeah, <laughs> I learned that. Eh? It's like kind of nice too. Yeah, weirdly enough. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, I um. I had a lot of uh, rookie mistakes and stuff, but um, yeah. But that's good. There's a lot to work on and a lot of time you can shave off in future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, mum. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's so much to, to chat about with you. Um, let's, go, let's go right back, eh? Should we go right mm-hmm. back? So you went to um, St. Kent's. Unfortunately. <laughs> and, and, you, um, and I, I read somewhere you, like, you hated it and this is sort of how you found music. Yeah, no, I, um, there was like a, a sort of... I guess you'd call it a playground incident at school, which sort of um, resulted in me kind of not being the dude that everyone wants to hang out with or whatever. And what, you, did you get in a fight? or No, nah, oh. so um, some dude bought weed to school and um, my mum asked me how my day was at school. I was like, oh, yeah, all good. Like, saw weed for the first time in my life, my mum being way too protective when and essentially... Knocked on these dudes and oh, um, no. yeah, yeah yeah so uh, uh, 
I was that guy. <laughs> um, and yeah, so no one really liked me. Um, yeah, so I would go to the music center and um, at lunch and stuff, and I would just hope that the uh, rehearsal rooms are open and just kind of. It was sort of just like a solace mm. for a while and just um, took my mind off how <laughs> everyone's an asshole. Yeah, it was a very slow uh, growth of my own confidence. And um, yeah, but it's uh, it all kind of stemmed back from from not really enjoying school as, as kind of how I developed that passion and probably the angsty uh, yeah. songwriterness that, that, that helped me succeed. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And um, so you, you taught yourself to play the guitar by watching YouTube clips, which seems mm. remarkable to me. And guitar is one of those things, you know, you, you practice and you get better. Is mm. singing the same or were you always a good singer? Absolutely. I was a fucking awful singer. Were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh God, I would hate... Have you seen the v- video of Ed when he's playing himself from when he's 15? <laughs> it's, it's those vibes. It was, oh, so bad. But it's just um, it's like anything. Eh? You, it, when you're obsessed with it and it's your passion, you can't stop doing it. Eventually, you just get better. And I think like the one thing that I was like gifted with vocally is just tone, I guess. like you know, Someone can sing and hit all the right notes, but if it just sounds kind of annoying or whatever, like it's not going to work. So I... I yeah, I guess I was lucky with my tone, but everything else was pretty hard earned. <laughs> I live by a rule of like I want to be better than I was yesterday, as yeah, cliche as, as it is. So I'm always looking to improve on on the mm. last performance or the last song or the last anything. So yeah, yeah, mm. hopefully getting better. Yeah, oh, absolutely, hundred percent. And so, um, and this has been well documented over the years. So, 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 you, once you leave school, you, you know, you've got a job as a car groomer or whatever, and then mm. you go uh, to the UK on a one way ticket with yeah. like twenty bucks in your pocket. <laughs> now, you, you're you're from a nice, loving, stable family. Like, yeah. how how did they let this happen? So, did um, no one talk you out of it? So, <laughs> so that if we go back to school, yeah. Um, where the irony sort of comes in with this weed thing is, um, like, I didn't really have many friends because of that. So the couple friends that I did have, we were little rat bags, essentially. Like, we pissed up and smoked weed and did drugs and, and all of that stuff. Um, and, yeah, so my parents are, are, are very uh, – my dad's from Greymouth and <laughs> <laughs> ne- never, uh, never done any – anything out of line. Um, my mum is from a super Christian family and um, so their little their little boy uh, smoking weed and coming home stoned for dinner was, uh, <laughs> I, may as, I may as well have been the devil himself. <laughs> um, and the fact that I would do that every night <laughs> without fail. How, how old were you then? Like, I would have been 15, right. 16. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was just blitzed off my mind because life for me was just very painful so it was like a bit of a twisted paradox really like I I was feeling so much pain that uh, like smoking weed with my friends was the only way to numb it out but obviously that didn't work well at home so uh, push led to shove at home and um, basically I uh, with my other sisters they have uh, their own sort of mental health issues and stuff um, over the years and our, our family home just became a war zone essentially mm. um, me being a little shit I was on computers trying to hack people and just I uh, just I was a little mm. shit basically and so they kicked me off to boarding school I basically didn't really talk to my my family for because my sisters hated me as well, so going on going on three or four years, uh, I didn't really talk to my family, and so being in that angsty phase of of being a teenager and being a songwriter, um, when I went to Ed Sheeran's show and saw that um, this dude dressed like a like kind of like I was dressing and yeah, just a hoodie and yeah, hoodie and jeans yeah, yeah. or cargo shorts or whatever, rocking up with his guitar and this little <laughs> pedal, just like blowing away an arena. I was like. You know what, like, I think this is what I want to do. I want to, and, like, my motivation came from the wrong place. Like, I wanted to prove everyone at school, fuck you. It, my, my whole family, fuck you. And so, obviously, that's not the greatest uh, energy behind your motivation, but that's what it was for me for a long time. No, so. no, no, I, I disagree. I think I think that's good. If, if, mm. like, if, that's, if that's what it takes to put a fire under you. That's, that was the attitude that I had for a very long time was, I'm just going to prove everyone wrong. Yeah. I'm going to go in and do the most uncomfortable shit ever. And it was uncomfortable, you know. Like So I uh, I was kicked out of home um, and 
I was working as a car groomer, like you said, uh, in in uh, Glen Innes, which is like not the nicest place, um, and definitely wasn't at the time as well. Um, and so, uh, my flatmate at the time was a ex uh, ex very hard drug addict, and so he saw my uh, he saw my weed uh, in my room, <laughs> didn't like it. Um, he threatened to kick me out, and so. I was like, you know what? Like, now's the time to do it. Now's now's the fucking time. Uh, everyone hates me. <laughs> um, I've got enough to go over to the UK. I'm just gonna go and fucking do it. And so I went over there, and again, that was its whole own journey that I could talk about for hours. But um, mm. but yeah, it, it was a crazy up and down journey. But I, I think the one thing. You know, obviously, as you're growing and all these crazy things are happening to you because you're thrusting yourself into this crazy world. Like, I, I think the one thing that kept it together was just, yeah, that sort of motivation to just say, fuck you to everyone mm. that doubted me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Far out. What a story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, I mean, your parents must be so relieved now. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think they are. I think they are. I you, think they the thought boys I was going to be a heroin addict or yeah. something like ending up in jail. But, yeah, no, they... Uh, I, it took them a long time to get it. Even even when um, I'd signed my record deal, uh, they didn't understand what that meant. I make like they're not like Amish people. I'm making them out to sound like these, like <laughs> oh no, they're, no like, they're just normal like provincial yeah, or regional New Zealanders. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, yeah. it's probably weird having your son become a pop star. Yeah, and so so they didn't understand what that meant, and so we didn't really start like repairing our or I didn't really start repairing my my bond with my my dad and my mum and my sisters until. Move on came out as the as the first single because right. they could tangibly see it and hear it on the radio. That like, oh shit, that's that's yeah, boy. yeah, exactly. So that's when things started to change. Is when um, so yeah, I, I'd got back from the UK and um, and Europe and like I said, that's a whole nother journey. And there's a million people that saved my ass and and helped me out along the way. But yeah, like once, once I came back from that and they they started to see that, that's when. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of the negativity and that sort of "oh fuck you, I'm going to prove everyone wrong" attitude sort of started to morph into um, something else, um, which uh, you know the ego kind of got big or whatever in the end. Yeah. But um, it was a nice transition phase into the phase that I I'm in today, which I'm I'm super happy with. I haven't thought about anyone at school for a very long time. Yeah, you know, yeah. what I mean, like, um, have any of them tried to hit you up? Oh yeah, and you're like, you uh, know the f- yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's 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 all it's no negative, you know. But it's just, um, yeah, I'm just in a different place. It, it's real funny because yeah, like I said at the start, it was very uh, almost a little bit of a dark motivation, and then once you got it all, mm. um, you know. Th- thrusting a young man into fame and success and and girls and money and rock star drugs and all of that shit like then that's a whole nother crazy phase and and to get out of that and sort of start really focusing on the inner has yeah. been, been nice and obviously running really helps with that too yeah how is your mental health is you mean i mean there must have been some dark times when you're in the uk i'm guessing and you're sort of um you're busking and then you're using that that busking money to pay for that night's accommodation in a hostel mm. like that must have been you know london in winter is a grim place yeah i mean when i was there like honestly my mental health was great like yeah, was it? yeah. yeah uh, it was just me against the world and so that was enough to get me out of bed every day and properly motivated mm. to go like oh, i'm just not going to stop until until this happens. So that was a um, it's almost like ignorance is bliss kind of thing, you know. Like mm. I thought, young and dumb. Yeah, really, really. And uh, I the at that stage the goal was record deal, record deal or bust. Like I don't care if I have to go to Tanzania to to sign a record deal. I'm going to sign a record deal. And um, yeah, so so. Mental health then wasn't really a problem. Like, I, I was so driven, um, you know, like, I mean, I was so gross that there was no, t- there's no, not, I didn't, <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean you're so gross? I was ugly and fat and everything, so there was no time for girls. Oh, come on. Girls, girls didn't want me back then. Um, so, so like, I was very focused and very, uh, and li- life was, like, good. And then, yeah, I think, uh, for me, the mental health uh, issues really started, um, happening sort of in that next phase of um, all the all the fame and things like starting to work out uh, when you realize that it's it's not what you 
thought it was going to be. Like the first, um, you know, because you're like a, a young kid who's just been broken, homeless, and now you get to play gigs and or girls are throwing themselves at you. It's like it's not it's it's a very easy place to um, for that moral line to sort of. Oh, it's a candy store. Absolutely, and and you know I'm I'm 19. I've probably slept with one girl, two girls, and. You know, it starts happening for for a young man, and uh, and it's and it's very exciting. But that you you do it enough, and you realize these people aren't here for me, mm. and and that's a very sobering realization, and a very massive one for me was like, oh shit, I'm just a, a notch in all these people's belts. They don't give a fuck about me, mm. and so that mm. that was you're a, you're like a trophy, yeah, essentially, and. Um, I think... Oh, poor Mitch being used for his body. <laughs> yeah. well, no, 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 I'm joking. I, I, I actually had an experience recently, like, I was like, damn. And, and yeah, I think for me, that, that realisation, that was the big mental health sort of battle was like, okay, so your ideal of what you, you thought this was going to be your whole life, you, you got there. Like, congratulations, you, you did what you never thought you were going to do. But the reality of the situation is, uh, you know, like... I'm sure every young dude thinks that a rock star is, I did, thinks that all, all your problems are going to be solved. You know, you, you'll you make a bunch of money and everyone loves you and, and, and that's it. But, yeah, the, the reality is a lot different and, and being a songwriter, being introspective, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of inner dialogue and battle about who do you really want to be? Do you want to be Mr... Uh, it looks like the man to the world, but but in reality, you're at home alone and you're miserable. Mm. Or do you really want to take a hard look at yourself and the things you don't like about yourself, work on them, and then sort of hope and trust that everything's going to be a lot more wholesome and a lot more uh, fulfilling and authentic. Know? Yeah, authentic. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I've had a lot of battles recently, uh, just personal shit, just ups and downs of mm. of life. But and generally speaking, like in a in a good place now, but you know how it goes. It's it's always like this, but that's sort of the fun of it. Yeah, it's a constantly moving sort of thing, isn't it? It's yeah. tough. How old are you now? 26. Yeah, because I reckon I didn't have any mental health stuff going on until probably um, probably like 40. Mm. And then there's just like a, a bunch of life stuff that um, I probably didn't address as thoroughly as what I should have. Mm. You know, and it's... Um, it's almost like, hey, if, 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 say something bad happens, it's like a, di- a dirty piece of like clothing that you've worn to the gym and you stuff it in that bag and then mm. you put another piece in the bag and that, eventually that, the smell of that bag is going to come back and it's going gonna, it's gonna to yeah, reek. I'm pretty sure I've literally got that situation <laughs> going on right now. No, but I, I, to- I totally agree. I totally agree, bro. And, and you know, I think uh, it's a bit of a blessing and a curse for me to have such an introspective and, and sensitive sort of way of, of approaching life, but... I'm really grateful that I can like be aware of these things and face them head on because yeah, you, that bag can get real damn smelly. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it, if you don't, yeah, if you don't, if you don't wash those clothes, it's um, one day it just gets so smelly that everyone can smell it. Yeah, one th- one thing which I um I fully admire about you, and it's um you know you've got this at a young age, and I, I'm still not quite there yet it's almost like you're good at spotting triggers like uh you've been off social media for a while Mm. um because you i'm guessing you're like okay my mental health isn't where i want it to be this is toxic i'm gonna get off it whereas me it's like i know it's bad but i'll just keep doing it yeah keep mindlessly (laughs) scrolling for hours on end yeah yeah well i mean i I guess that's it It's, it's just kind of like to spot the triggers right you have to have gone through that before like for me, it was like, I've spent so many hours, I even have a song coming out about it, um, so many hours scrolling and so many hours feeling miserable that I've like identified, I'm like, hey, like, you're doing this thing, it's making you feel miserable, like, are you, are you going to keep doing it or are you going to stop? And it's we all know it's hard to stop, like, it's mm. fucking hard to stop, it's yeah. dopamine, we're, we're all literally addicted. Mm. I found like, after a couple of weeks, it got a lot easier, but... I went through a pretty rough breakup and it was it was all I needed to just get me over that line. You yeah. know, like I was like, you know what? Well, um, if I don't need to be impressing anyone or like keeping up a sort of image and if I'm not releasing any music right now or touring, like 
I just need to look after myself, like mm. because, yeah, I, I think I sort of view Instagram and social media as like it's a world, and it's definitely a, a world, and it's definitely a people like to call it fake or whatever, and it is in some ways, but it's definitely a real world. It mm. definitely fucking exists. Yes, um, but that's just that world. We got the real world too, and I just really wanted to focus on the real world for a bit because, in in reality. Well, at least how I look at it, all Instagram and and Facebook uh, is is just like a comparison, yeah. Like, and without trying to put negative connotations on anything, like it's just a, oh, I'm gonna look at you and like, yeah, I just, I just couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't do yeah. it anymore because, you know, I I, fig- I figure in life like. I've had so much like fucked up crazy shit happen to me and I'm really good at dealing with it. But for some reason, a woman <laughs> just fucking break my heart so much. <laughs> Is that right? And, you just fall in love or? Yeah, uh, well, I, it's not that I fall in love with, with everyone, but like when I fall in love, I'm just you go like, hard. whoa. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so I, I, I figured that like, yeah, it was all I needed in that time. Like it was just like, it was beyond the line of um, dealable and undealable. So mm. I just shut it off and really focused on me. It's so cliche, but you know, like I, I've been, I always find inspiration from fighters. And there's this guy uh, who just won the lightweight boxing title from Australia called George Cambosis. And I just watched all of his shit around this time where I was, you know, getting off social media and, and sort of, starting to move forward from this relationship and he would just talk about hard work and discipline and purpose and he works out three times a day and I just said, fuck it, I'm going to do what this motherfucker does, I'm going to work out three times a day and it's it's been really good. As yeah. you know, like the endorphins and and I think for me staying distracted is a key for my mental health. Like yeah. if... If I sit around at home all day and I think about things, I'm a, I'm literally a professional overthinker. Mm. Like, so you got to oh, yeah, pick, and, pick and choose your times. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if you if you're gonna go, hey, I'm gonna pick this four hours of this day to write a song or essentially overthink about something, you schedule it. You know, like schedule right. your overthinking because otherwise, if it takes over my day, it's when um, I just start falling down into the hole again. You know, and and. Yeah, it's it's a lot harder to pick yourself up out of that hole than it is to just do the right healthy things every day. Yeah. I went to um, therapy once, and the um, I said to the therapist about the overthinking thing. Mm. She said, "When you recognise you're doing it, just ask yourself, is this helpful?" Mm. And um, I find that really good. You sort of you rein yourself back in because it never is helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you're aware that you're doing it, then you can stop it. Yeah, and awareness is everything. Eh? I I think for, for me. And my mental health journey as a, as as a whole, and sort of, I guess you know, being bundled into the advocate category of sorts or activist, like yeah, mate, I, it's so good that you talk about it. it really, oh, is. I mean, I don't get how people don't. To be mm, honest, I, yeah. I had a radio interview the other day, and 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 the lady was like, "Oh, you're so vulnerable." I was like, "Am I too vulnerable?" Sorry, no, no, <laughs> but, it's, like, just, it's just 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 your authenticity. But uh, do you think that comes because you're a songwriter as well, and you're good at you're good at um, communicating these ideas in song form? Yeah, I think um, I don't even know where the songwriting came mm. from, to be completely honest. Um, I never really did it growing up. Um, it's, but I always felt within me that I'm, I feel shit more than your typical person. Yeah. Like, you wear your heart on your sleeve. Yeah, and rejection in, in any form has always been the dagger of all <laughs> daggers for me. And yeah, I, I mean, it's. It's probably my life's challenge, you know, like yeah. I, it's it's real hard for me, even to this day, like I had a thing last week with a girl that just kind of made no sense, like rejection wise, and for a couple of days, like even though it shouldn't have, it was just like, just felt like I was getting stabbed, mm. you know, And but I, I think what I'm trying to get at, I guess, is like, I'm aware of the fact that, and I make jokes about the fact that I am the most oversensitive, overthinking uh, for the lack of what I would get called if I was a young boy hanging out with other young boys, a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's your superpower. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. If you embrace that, you know, like, 
I see so many New Zealand men that I knew, I know have a personality like mine or a soul like mine that's bubbly and, and whatever, but they're so preconditioned to uh, either numb it out or hate that about themselves. Mm, you yeah. know what I mean? I think it's so wrong about New Zealand culture is like, so you just got to embrace your fucking weirdness. You yeah. know what I mean? Because like, I feel like I see so many blokes my age, they, um, I'm generalizing here and I got nothing against like, uh, you know, blue collar workers or whatever. But I feel like I've seen so many of, of my mates growing up who could have been brilliant, creative professionals felt like they had to be forced into mm. being a builder or a plumber because, um, like a tra- that, traditional masculine role. Because, exactly, because yeah. that's what a man does. And a man doesn't sit down with another man and talk about his mental health journey because mm. that's what pussies do. Yeah, And I, I just think that's um, it's kind of like, uh, it's not my main mission with this whole thing, but it's like a little side mission that I, I really want to try and just, you know, I, I understand that as a New Zealand, well, quote unquote, pop star, like a lot of, Women naturally will respect me more than the men, but if I can get the respect of the men, that's the message I want to mm. give to them is, man, just be yourself. You don't have to be freaking the fucking <laughs> stone hard fucking dude with no emotions because yeah. it's so sad. It I have a friend in, in Southland and she's a she's a farmer and um, I just remember her messaging me must have been twice or three times in a year being like, guys around... The, the farms down south are just they're dying yeah. like they and and that's because I, I I at least believe it's because there's this stigma that you can't talk to your your mates about mm. how you feel and like yeah. I mean I know I feel ten times bad like you should probably fucking charge me for therapy bro <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're so right though like like t- you're not talking about it and just bottling it up that's why um. Yeah, I, I reckon that's why a lot of people end up like taking their own life because they, they're just so frustrated and they just don't know. But talking about it definitely helps. 100%. Mm. Yeah, and you just, I mean, you just got to find your ways of, of being comfortable with yourself. And mm. How's your self-talk? Like, is it negative self-talk or are you quite kind on yourself? I have my days. I have my days where I t- talk to myself like I'm Conor McGregor. You're the fucking man. I like look in the mirror. I'm like, you the man. You the man. Uh, and I literally do that I, uh, shamelessly. Um, and I probably uh, eight out of ten days. I'm um, Conor McGregor yeah. self talk. And those other two days, it's um, what I've kind of found is usually I can always bring myself back to that positive self talk because mm. when you break shit down and problems in your life, like I usually find that like. Uh, 90% of my, my perceived problems are actually out of my control. Mm. So when you, it's like we were saying before, yeah. if you can yeah. uh, sort of say, step away from and go, is this helpful or do I need to be stressing about this? And if the answer is no, then you're the fucking man. You're the fucking man. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But um, yeah, like uh, it's that's basically it. So it's, that's it's so either, good. It's either brutal or extremely arrogant yeah. <laughs> oh, no, the, I think the, 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 it's good of you to admit the um, the Conor McGregor thing because I think that's um, incredibly healthy like you should be mm. your biggest cheerleader and it's forced you know what I mean uh, you fake it enough and you, and start, you start, start believing it. it Yeah. and I did this I did this same self talk when I was in the basement of a German hostel sleeping in a fucking bowling alley um I would look at the mirror and say the same thing. And I, I didn't fucking believe it. <laughs> Dude, bro, you're, you're fat and ugly. You got pimples all over your fucking face. You're, you're awful. You're the, you're, no one else even the bowling alley. You're yeah. a fucking man. You're the man. You're the man, baby. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard some, um, oh, I wish I could remember who it was. It was on a podcast. Um, some lady wrote a book about high-fiving the mirror every morning. Yeah. 100%. Um, yeah. 100%. And it, sound, it sounds arrogant, but I think what if people don't understand the, the, the sort of the f- psychology or philosophy behind it is it's like I don't look at myself every time I see myself and go like oh you the man <laughs> I, like no and the, the point behind it is it's just essentially my own self battle with that it's like you know do you want to step up and, and be a champion today well you know what a champion would say mm. when he looks in the mirror I fucking believe in that guy Yeah. so yeah it's, it's just uh, I just have fun with it I have a lot of fun with it. I think that's really good. That's really powerful stuff. 
yeah, I mean, I, I hope it inspires someone to look in the mirror and say, you're the fucking man, but just make sure no one else is looking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and do that more. Cause my, uh, yeah, my self-talk, it can be terrible at times. Eh? Yeah. Terrible. And uh, sometimes I'll, I'll catch myself doing it. I'll rein myself in and I, I think, I would never speak to another person like that. 100%. I would never accept another person speaking to me like that. 100%. So why am I being so hard on myself? Yeah, no, what's the quote? No one, no one, treats, no one treats you worse than you treat yourself. But yeah, I, I, I think if, if you can find a way to identify like why, why am I feeling like that and then pushing that into just force feeding it into the, into the fake it till you make it. Eh? Yeah. And it just becomes habit. But yeah, like, I guess like everyone has their days, you know what I mean? Mm. And of course I do as well. Like, you know, especially recently it's, it's just like that. So yeah, yeah I think you, it's just discipline really, isn't mm. it? At the end of the day. Yeah, I, I believe that for sure. What's your what's your relationship like with weed at the moment? Do you, did, did you find when you start training for a marathon you smoke less or? No, nah, probably no. more. <laughs> <laughs> probably more. Yeah. I've, got a, I've got a mate that likes to, likes to, likes to have, have a joint and then go for a run. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm that, I'm that guy, yeah. So, I mean, me and weed have had a funny one. Um, I've always loved weed. Um, it's always just, uh, I've always felt it's got a hard rap. So I'm on that team. I won't go into that too much. But um, yeah. I've, always, I've never had a problem with stopping weed like so there's a few times when i was younger and um i was just smoking too much weed and it was just fucking obvious for everyone involved and got to that stage and i was like you know what i'm fucking smoking too much weed stopped for a couple years and kind of dibble dabbled a bit and um yeah so my last girlfriend didn't like weed but I was still smoking it, but just not around her. Right. And so when... when what, were you, were you being, like, super stealthy about it? Like, um, you know... I was, yeah. I, 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 I would never, never lied about oh, it. Oh, okay. Never lied yeah. about it, but, like, you just know... Just didn't do it, like, brazenly in her yeah, face. Yeah, stoners, we have our little tricks of the trade, and, like, you know, um, that's all I'll say about it. But, you know, you got your clear eyes and your deodorant and your perfumes and, and stuff. But, um, but yeah, so when, when that ended, um, I tend to... I tend to like smoke a lot of weed, and when I'm feeling a lot of pain, if it's too much, yeah. Just, this is not health advice, you know. <laughs> I mean, like that's just kind of what I do, and um, I I just found when I'm stoned and I'm running, I just I go into that meditative state mm-hmm. a lot easier, and I'm I can just I feel alive, and I feel the blood coursing through me, and the impact on 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 the joints, which is. Um, probably not going to be well in 20 years, but you know, I, I like that feeling now. And, um, yeah, I, I it's always helped me creatively. It's mm. always helped me, uh, with depression and anxiety and wow, that's I, amazing. Cause uh, uh, I, most health experts would probably say it's going to make you depressed. Yeah. Oh yeah. Than, I mean, but, it, but if it works for you, then, then that's absolutely. Good. And like I said, you know, I'm not, not. <laughs> I'm, no, not, I'm not no. saying people should follow what I, my daily routine, but um, but you you didn't have one before the Auckland Marathon, did you? Yeah, I did. Did yeah, you? Yeah. So <laughs> you would have been the it, only guy there. Yeah, that yeah. Why? Yeah, so it was, it was quite run funny as high before you even started. It was quite funny. So, like, if we go back to my uh, toilet story, um, mum's like, uh, mum's like in the car waiting, and yeah. instead of taking a number two. <laughs> I went and went and packed a bong, and um, and and so I went in the car, and, and my mum was like, "Have you been smoking already?" I was like, "Yeah, like I don't I don't run if I'm not stoned, to be completely honest." But I just love that feeling of just getting away from myself because, like I said, so uh, um, as people can probably tell, I'm it's a million miles an hour mm. up top, so. Any chance to get in that state of, um, you know, I, I don't like being ADHD. Like I don't I don't enjoy it. So are you are you d- diagnosed yeah, ADHD? Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I I do anything I can to get in that state mm. of um, of just whoosh, you know. And mm. yeah, I, I do love a do love a little uh, pre run toke. Mm. That's amazing. Post run toke that too. Is unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. I haven't I haven't had any for probably like three or four months. So just because yeah. the last time I last time I had some, I had a mm. I had like a panic attack. Like yeah, a, yeah. I was just overthinking things in a in a really bad way, and it made me um 
It made me sad in a way about the last referendum because if you go to a store in like LA or somewhere, or somewhere it's mm. um, legalised, they, they, they'll ask you what you want. Like, do you want something to zone out? Yeah. Do you want something that's going to help you focus? Yeah. Do you want something that's going to help you run the marathon? But here yeah. you just buy a, bit, buy a bag and you're not sure what you're Hope getting. the best, day. Eh? Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that's an interesting conversation to have, yeah, because, I mean, obviously with my interest in it and stuff, like I've been to America and see how, how, how it operates there. And, yeah, I mean... It's a, it's a bit of a potluck dinner here, eh? You just, well... you literally yeah. potluck. Yeah, literally, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, what are you... Oh, I want to go to sleep, and then you go to your guy, and then he gives you some shit that makes you overthink, or, yeah, like, yeah, it's... Jeez, you, um, you completely defy the, um, the sort of stereotype any non-smoker has about a stoner. Like, I'm sitting in mm. front of you now, you're fit, you're buffed, mm. you, you, your skin's glowing, Thank you're you. motivated, you're yeah. energised... Uh, yeah, I I think that's been a, I mean, like I said, with my family story growing up and I, it's always been something for me that I, I just, I've never un, un, understood. I, I, I think I can, I can understand how people uh, that are unmotivated, well, that's a very loud hose. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> There's, um, is it a hose? I was wondering Sounds what like a water blasting. Yeah, thing. water blasting going on yeah, outside. So I, I think, um, yeah, for me, it's always, I've never got it, but I can understand how people like they'll get real faded or whatever and they'll like fucking eat some pies and <laughs> like I, I i get that but it's um you sort of get it's like riding a bike you get good at smoking weed so <laughs> like event, eventually you're like maybe i shouldn't just sit on my fat ass all day getting fucking blazed eating cheetos i like being high but maybe i should do something mm, you know mm. so it's like when you make that switch mentally of like this is just something i use to make things a little better but i i i still get my day done i still work out three times a day i still write songs i still still call my mum. still you know like it's i i think it, it all it's all up here and and it's all down to the individual but i love i love being the anti stereotype because I don't have to force it down people's throats. Like, if people know me and they know that I enjoy smoking weed or just, I mean, you know, eating weed or whatever, whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever you want, um, I just like to be the example mm. rather than be like, hey, well, you know, like, I actually work out quite a bit or I, I actually, uh, I'm actually quite motivated. Like, people will see it and I yeah. think naturally, slowly, it might take two, three generations, but hopefully that stigma will disappear because... Mm. Yeah, I get branded like that all the time, you know, and like um, if you go to, uh, I try and be professional and, and, you know, if I'm doing something like I, like important, like yeah, I want to be Yeah, time and place, of course, yeah. Um, but I think it's quite brave of you to talk about it so openly because you know, I've, mm. I've got a lot of mates who are, you know, high achieving A-types, mm. great jobs and stuff and they smoke weed, but they'd never admit it to anyone because you're know, just for fear of, I don't know, I suppose. Judgment, like, like, it's just that stigma we're yeah. talking about, eh? Yeah, I, and I, I get it. Um I guess I just got a fucking cool job. Yeah. I'm lucky, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And where are things at with the music? Where are things, because music's like a cyclical thing, isn't it? You have an album, you tour it, you, are you in the writing phase, the recording phase? I, the... I'm in the final, I, final stages of the recording phase. I could go on here and slag off my record label <laughs> till the cows come home. Like uh, the last three years of my life due to my Australian record label has been hell on earth absolute hell on earth um i haven't been able to like publicly say anything but it's i've been quite jaded with music mm. lately to be honest like not music love music just the politics just behind the it industry right yeah and so we've finally got to a stage where um new single coming out um which is sounding amazing and i'm really mm. happy with it because uh the last single i didn't want to release it was the label forced Forced it out. The last one, that, that's um, Be Somebody. Be Somebody, yeah. That's a great song, though. Thanks, bro. Yeah, I mean, you, I, why, didn't, why didn't you want to release it? I just felt like it was not a single. Mm. Um, and it's just a, it's not the vibe I wanted to be giving off in a pandemic, you know, like, oh, everything's so sad. It's like, <laughs> no, you want to be a bit of light, you know? So this one's very upbeat, and, and the album's really fun, yeah. um, despite, you know, all the crazy stuff that's happened, but... Yeah, it's um, it's been very frustrating, and and my uh, like uh, the New Zealand label, and and as you know, Kim Bosha, just an absolute yeah, legend, boss Absol of Sony, absolute yeah. legend, and, absolute um, queen. We uh, unfortunately got caught up with the another international label, and it's just been really tough. But uh, 
any uh, sort of opportunity to learn big lessons in life without having them on the fucking front page of the paper is, is a very big one. Yeah. You, you hear so much bad stuff about record labels. What, mm. Is the contract just too tight, too restrictive, or are you being ripped off? What's the... Yeah, I mean, there's no two ways about it. I, I'm just getting ripped the fuck off. Um, like, I signed my deal when I was homeless. Uh, I didn't have a manager... They knew they were fucking me, like, but uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I didn't, because like I said, at, at that time in my life, goal number one, goal number two to 5,000 was record deal. Just get a fucking record mm. deal and we'll worry about the rest. And, I, suppose, I suppose that's why they get people to sign their life away. Exactly. It's exactly it. So no one really gets out of their first deal. Um, my first deal is for three albums. Um, basically, there's an, a, a gentleman's agreement between my label and I right now that because of the fucking around that they did for the last three and a half years that we'll cut one album off and I'll release this album and, and be a free agent. You're invited to that party. Put it that way. I'm going to be fucking losing yeah. my mind that night oh because <laughs> it, yeah, it's been, it's now been six years of, of just, it's so frustrating. If I could paint it out as simple as I can for someone who's listening, it's, um, it started off from day one. I had songs ready to go, ready to be released. Um, October release date becomes November, becomes December. Um, that was the fir- first one. And I thought, oh, two months, like, this isn't too bad. If I, I can live with two-month delays. Next um, next phase of releases, um, March turns into April, turns into December, turns into the next September. And so... That's like a year and a half of shagging around. And then now since then, it's been another three years of just waiting and waiting. And I, 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 the, the thing is, the way I look at it is I have 200 million streams. I've made you wow. a fucking bunch of money. Yeah. I've made zero dollars and zero cents from them. Zero dollars and zero cents. So all my money comes from playing shows. Um, every, every single cent. So basically, um, once I'm out of this deal, like I'll be able to make money off my music again. And how, how are you coping financially, obviously, with um, the inability to tour at the moment? Yeah, it's tough. It's been real tough. Um, I was lucky I got to play one gig over summer, which will, um, I mean, keep me off the streets, essentially. But, yeah, it's been really tough. Um, going into, t- t- well, just before COVID hit, um, Sunday morning was really working. It was looking like it was going to start working overseas as well. And then COVID great hit. song. Thanks, man. And and COVID hit and it just, uh, yeah, it was like a nuclear bomb. And just since then, um, I think I've played two gigs or three gigs maybe. And um, that's the only money I've been able to make in almost going mm. on two and a half years now. So it's it's tough because, yeah, like I, I was really catching momentum and would have been in a position to hopefully be, you know, looking at getting a house in the next yeah. like year or two. Yeah. And now, I'm, now I've, there'll be a lot of probably – Fast food workers that have the same or more more money than I do. I remember getting put on benzodiazepines just uh, just after I signed my record deal. What's that? Is that like an antidepressant? Uh, it's like Xanax, Xanax. Uh, the oh, yeah. anti anxiety. Because okay. um, I was having panic attacks. I didn't. I thought I was having heart issues, but um, it was it was because I just signed my record deal and we hadn't had any songs out yet. But I was so paralyzed with anxiety that I was going to be another one of those New Zealand flash in the pan, heard of them once, one song on the radio guys. And that it was my anxiety about that was so bad about my legacy and my vision that mm. I got hooked on these fucking awful little drugs. So as I'm, I'm lucky, but there's, uh, there's definitely going to be some unlucky ones. Would that be the worst thing in the world being a one hit wonder? I mean, depends how big. Uh, depends if, uh, like, if <laughs> we're talking New Zealand one hit wonder. Definitely not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if we're talking, um, yeah, what's, what's a good never, example? Never gonna give you up. Oh yeah, Rick Astley. Like, yeah. I, I, I could live with that. Um, yeah, it, it's. I don't know. I, I think all jokes aside, it, it, it would be hard for me because uh, I I want to be remembered as someone that that can tell stories and not just not just have a a moment. Yeah, I think you're on track. 
Thanks, man. Sunday morning. Well, that was a that was a great song. Is that is that the the, the, the biggest song you've ever written in terms of commercial success? No, uh, no. Uh, Bright blue skies. Uh, Bright blue skies went uh, platinum in Australia without any radio. Um, uh, and I think it went gold in Sweden. Mm. I think it's sixty million streams or something. It's um, that's the that's the. I don't need a goddamn thing yeah, from anyone. That one. That's the one. Right. Right. Yeah, that's the one. That's a tune. Yeah, yeah it's um. It's crazy when you can't really fathom those numbers, to be honest. Mm. Like, oh my God, when you really think about the scale of it, it's quite humbling, you know? Mm. There's so... For you, it's... For me, it's just a a moment being emotional in a room, writing a song, and then the next minute, you know, I get messages from... I got a message from my mate who's in Costa Rica saying, saying fucking... Oh, he was in Spain a few months ago saying I was on the coast of Spain and heard... Your song getting played in a cafe and just wow, like that's that. cool. It's like whoa, yeah. You, know, you really can't fathom it because you're always so just focused on the next, the next, the next. Mm. So, yeah, still mind blowing to this day. Yeah, do you ever take a moment to pause, pause and reflect and think about what you've done, or are you just constantly eyes forward? I, I really, I hate to. This is probably a bit of a textbook answer, but um, <laughs> I, I I really didn't until. Um, everything was forced to stop with COVID. Like, I, I would have been. I feel for my first girlfriend because I just would have been a fucking pain in the ass. Deal. Ne- what's next? What's next? What's mm. next? Oh, song songs number one on radio. What's better than number one? What's next? What's next? What's next? Mm. And that was my. I thought that was going to be my superpower that brought me above everyone else in the global sphere. Just like, that drive. Yeah, just the drive, out and out, perseverance and, and, and drive. And I thought that was my that was my number one mm. strong suit. And then when all this label crap happened and I um, basically sat in an apartment alone in Australia for nine months not able mm. to do anything, yeah. that'll make you fucking take stock pretty quick. So that was that was really good for me in that... that and, like it, it sort of led me to the place where I got to about six months ago where I was ready to go, you know what, social media, all of this, just not for me right now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, was it hard? Because I, I feel like social media, Instagram in particular, is probably one of my worst addictions. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd say it's it's 95 plus percent of the world too. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, it, I, it was hard for a couple weeks mm. it's just muscle memory I found mm. you know like you you get out of the your phone uh, whatever your little thing to get to Instagram is uh, two right swipes and a click up top or whatever <laughs> and you're there and, and you're back in your yeah. in, in dopamine land it's, but I found after two weeks I just barely thought about it you know um, mm. but that was probably made a bit easier for me to like with the motivation mm. to not want to see my ex-girlfriend or all of her friends on yeah. Instagram and stuff so yeah um yeah, that, see, that, that's another thing where I think it would be harder for you. Like, my, my DMs are very boring. Mitch James' <laughs> DMs, I'm sure there's a lot of exciting stuff going on there. Uh, but you, you want to hear the truth about this, Dom? And this is the cold, hard truth. Yeah. And, and it goes to back what we were talking about before. Um, the, it's real fun after a show. It's mm. beautiful girls, top to bottom. They don't message you the day after the show. Mm. They message you the night of the show. And right. they don't message you the day before the show. It's not about wanting to get married to a deep and sensitive and very attractive young singer-songwriter. <laughs> it's it's about getting a notch on their belt for the night and bragging to their friends. Yeah. So, like, yeah. It, it, what is that, just the sex appeal from seeing you on stage, do you think? So there, is, there is something very... You're very sexy about seeing someone on stage. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe yeah. and or maybe it's just a, it's just an out and out brag off, brag off, mm. you know. And, and that's that. I used to be happy. You were okay with that in the beginning. I was okay you, with yeah. that in the beginning, you know. Uh, I'm not okay with with that anymore. I, I'm. You're deeper I, than that. I'm, I'm searching for. I'm searching mm. for 
for the woman that I would like want to be with for the rest of my life. You know, and, like, have you just have you just ha- had enough uh, casual sex to last yeah. your lifetime? Yeah, I, I would probably say so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, Sorry, mum. <laughs> yeah, was, was it a similar path to Ed Sheeran? I, I don't like he he's he's married his um I think so like a girl he went to school with um yeah. and I'm guessing it's because she, you know she's one of the day ones so she knew yeah. him before any, anything else and I suppose I mean like, he's a, he's a different tier up altogether obviously but um yeah. you know you you must have like serious trust issues yeah you know, with I do, new, the yeah. intentions of new people you meet yeah and I'll I'll tell you a story a good story about which is real recent actually about that but with Ed I think it was I think. You know, I didn't. I haven't talked to him about it mm. um, personally, but just being a fan, like I, I'm pretty sure that's the general pathway he went on. Is you know, he must have realized more than I did. You know, because he's he must have been like you know, like this is awesome. Yeah. Like you know, Victoria's Secret. Like you said, another tear. Like he would be getting some some beautiful woman, mm. and I think yeah, he probably just would have realized the same thing that I did. Is you know, we're angsty little singer songwriters. Mm, <laughs> that that yeah. doesn't fill our cup, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do have massive trust issues, you know. Like, um, my first girlfriend, um, who is just an absolute angel, um, she met me before everything, and I just treated her like shit once things popped off uh, me. And um, it's hard, though. I mean, you. you yeah, you're not still beating yourself up about that. No, I'm not. Yeah, no, I'm good. not. But um, and has she forgiven you? No, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't think she has. But I, uh, the uh, yeah, like so with that, like I always even said to her, I was like, you know, like you know me before all of this, and that was that was really massive for me. Um, and then you know I went and lived my life and was an asshole and got what I deserved. Um, but what I realized then is like, oh shit, my uh, my ticket of the um, knew you before you were something, that's gone now. Mm. So you have to be hyper aware. And so my first girlfriend's probably killing herself laughing hearing that. <laughs> um, um, Good, he yeah, deserves it. Yeah, yeah. And, and fair enough, fair enough. Um, but I yeah, can, I can still say, tell you cut up about the first one. There's a lot no, of regret she, there. She's a, she's a good girl. Yeah. She's a really good girl with a good heart. Um, but Is she seeing anyone now? Uh, uh, probably, you don't know? I'm, yeah. I'm well blocked, I think. Yeah, right. Um, but, oh. but yeah, uh, you know, my, my point being is like, yeah, there's there's a lot of trust issues and like, I'm a trusting person. So like even for me to go into that last situation so open and be like, hey, you know, mm. well, yeah. Um, yeah, so it gets thrown in your face. But I think, you know, it's to quote Rocky, <laughs> you know, it ain't how, uh, whatever, you know, how many times you get hit and knocked down on the ground, it's, you know, you got to keep getting back up. So it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, all of that shit hurts, but it comes with the territory, you know. If I look back to that 16-year-old dude who's almost psychopathically driven to be the number one songwriter in the world, number one this, number mm. one, number one, you know, like, I'd look at that guy and say, hey, be careful what you wish for, dog, because mm. this is... Uh, you know, it's not a picnic. Yeah, and like I, I I'm a white picket fence dude. You know, mm. like my my dream is to yes have a very successful career and yes be balanced and fit and everything, but it's also to like ha- have a family and 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 want to mm. like have a loyal relationship where it's not egotistical or mm. have anything to do with Mitch James the the business or the songwriter but just uh, yeah. me you know and so do, do, but do you think you've always been a white picket fence dude or is, do you think it's part of it's because you ha- you have been on the other paddock and you've seen the grass isn't any greener <laughs> yeah I think it, I've you've done a lot of grazing in the other yeah. paddock <laughs> yeah yeah ain't much grass left um, yeah I think um, I think I've been on both sides yeah. eh, bro? I, I think I grew up I grew up watching I had two older sisters I grew up watching High School Musical you know those uh, the notebook so i started off little mr romance that's mm. how i became a songwriter because no one understands me but i got <laughs> such a good heart so that's where it all came from and then you know uh when things started going south at, at home or, and at school um you know and me and my boys are fucking smoking up and drinking piss and whatever like we we looked up to rappers and stuff like that, and that's when I sort of went like, oh, oh, you know, this this could be fun. And we go around the world, and like, 
because my mates essentially saved my life, you know, like I tried killing myself a couple of times when I was younger and like these boys really brought me out of my shell and really helped me. So I was like, I'm going to bring you with me and we're mm. going to, we're going to smoke so much weed and we're going to be so rich and we're going to have so much party. It didn't end up happening that way, but, um, I kind of had my own experience and I went into it myself. So mm. once it all started happening, you know, a couple of those boys had sort of fucked me over and we weren't friends and, um, my one best mate was overseas, and so it was just me, just in this uh, new new world of of fame and Instagram, this and girls and drugs and and gigs mm. and everything. And so, yeah, I lost myself in that for four or five years, and then um, just get, going back to the um, uh, taking your own life thing. How old how old were you then? Uh, again, I would have been fifteen, sixteen, 15, and I think man. maybe maybe seventeen. What was going like, on? I that's a good question. I. I so there's the stuff at school, and and when you're at school, that's obviously your whole life, mm-hmm. and so you can't see anything outside of it. Um, yeah, it was it was basically just school and and my family. My family was like uh, m- both of my sisters have have had some. I won't go into it just yeah. for, for their sake, but they've had some real bad, like real bad uh, mental health sort mm. of journeys and. They're absolute weapons, and they're, they're they're doing great now. But at the time, it was yeah, it was it was kind of like you wake up, you go to school. School's toxic. I hate every second of it, and I go home, and I fucking hate every second of it. Mm. So you just and constantly I go to bed miserable. And I wake up. Yeah. And I, yeah. Repeat. Yeah. And so the uh, the respite from that was, oh, should I go get high? And so I would go get high because that would make me feel mm. good. And then I'd go home and I'd get absolutely torn apart from it. I mean, my parents basically sort of fostered a, an environment where I felt like my my whole life I wasn't going to amount to shit. So it was it was really hard. And, um, yeah, I just uh, – I didn't know what I was doing. I just n- knew at the time I didn't want to live. And, um, yeah, I, I mean uh, – I remember like barricading my door with a couch and my sisters trying to get in and and all all hectic stuff. But um, thank God I'm, I didn't do anything and, and we yeah. got here today. Man, I'm sorry you went through that. No, it's okay, that's man. Terrible. It's terrible. That's part of the journey, mm. you know what I mean? And that's why like when people do ask me if they, they have advice or they want me to be an advocate or whatever, like... Uh, all I've got is my experiences, you know, so mm. I'm, I'm just, I'm glad to share them and let people know mm. that, yeah, you might hear me on the radio or whatever, but I'm just a bloke like you, you know, mm. <laughs> I feel shit too. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's rough at that AJ and you can see why the, um, the, the youth stats in this country are so, so bad because at the time it can seem like it's your whole fucking life and it can seem yeah. like there's no way out. It, Crazy yeah. world we're navigating at the moment. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's tough, but, um, if anyone's, if anyone's listening to this, that's, um, you know, got kids that are um, in, the, in that sort of age, or maybe you are in that age. You just feels like your, you know, life's not worth living. You just got to know that um, it, it's like a storm, man. A, a storm mm. always passes; it never mm. stays gloomy forever. Even though it might seem that way when you're in the middle of it, eh? Mm, absolutely. My mum always told me this too shall pass, mm. and it does. Oh, that's a good it, saying. It, it, al- it always does, yeah. And I mean, I can't imagine how hard it would be to be a parent of a kid in this mm. day and age. Yeah. Honestly, holy shit! But yeah, yeah it's it's crazy mm. out there. But it's um, yeah. So, were, so were, they, were they good parents? I know you said before that they used to say you wouldn't amount to much. Was that just like a, a necessary amount of tough tough love, or was it yeah, like a bit much? They they have the best intentions in the world. Like they they're great people, hearts of gold. Um, but you know what I realize is parents are just grown up kids, mm. and they that they, they're still trying to figure it out as well. Yeah, that's we what are. I mean. That's what I mean. Yeah. And and. It took me a very, a very, very long time to to acknowledge that. And once I acknowledged that, I've I've never had a negative sort of bit of energy towards them because, yeah, they're just they're just idiot kids that had <laughs> had more idiot kids. And we'll trying to figure it out. Yeah, but, but it must be such a relief as a parent, eh? Because um, when 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 your kid comes right. Yeah, that's it's weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, you got you got there. You're there. Yeah. You're, in a, you're in a great place, and they must um they they, they, they must. I don't know. I hope they look at each other and go, "We we did okay." Yeah, I hope they do too. Okay. They're, they're they're beautiful people, and it's it's a crazy journey. And I wouldn't change it for mm. anything. You know, like we uh, we're we're tough people, us Jameses, and 
you know, for them to be battling what they're battling with, haven't complained once. And, um, yeah, I I found it probably the biggest honour of my life to be able to run that marathon for them. So, uh, no heroin addict, jail junkie boy. Uh, <laughs> just, um, just, just, yeah, just high on weed. Just, just a stoner. <laughs> just a stoner. We can live with that. <laughs> oh, you could be a lot worse than that. All right. Hey, uh, mate, it's been a, a fantastic chat. I've taken up so much of your time. but we just Nah, any time, um, brother. Some quick fire running questions, eh? Mitchell Digby McCallum James. Yes. Is, is that the full yes, name? that's the full name. That's what it says on Wikipedia. It. Who well, the fuck put that on Wikipedia? That's pretty anyone? impressive. Yeah, yeah. Where did those names come from, the Digby McCallum? Dig, so I think Digby is great-grandfather on the da- on my dad's side. And I think McCallum, Brendan McCallum? No, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where McCallum yeah. comes from. All right. Mitch James, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, what do you what do you listen to when you run? I uh, bit of Bruce Springsteen lately. Huh. S- Springsteen, uh, this guy called Sam Fender, um, Holly Humberstone, who's a young uh, British singer songwriter. She's awesome. Um, I got like a big chunk in there of um, of like those classic uh, sort of like rap. Early two thousands ones, I got like Roy Jones, can't be touched, can't be stopped. <laughs> just yeah, it makes that, music. It, it makes me want to run through a wall. But yeah, I got like a, a big range, eh? But um, yeah, yeah. This the the staples I've found lately are sort of like that Springsteen like rock. I don't know why it's just getting me through. Mm. What sort of yeah? What sort of era is Springsteen? I'm a massive Bruce Springsteen fan. So I remember growing up, my dad like all my music taste came from my dad, and he had the um. He had the greatest hits with um, Springsteen in the, what do you call, overalls, like the, de- oh, the yeah. denim Dungarees. overalls. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just got all the, uh, like, it's got all the classics on it, you yeah. know, Hungry Heart, Born to Run. Born to Run's a fucking great running yeah. song, obviously. Um, what else? Uh, hey, little baby, is it oh, yeah, I'm on fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a, that's a weird lyric, eh? Hey, little girl, is your daddy home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he go and leave you all alone? It's a little I've got bit, a bad uh, desire. Oh, yeah, Bruce. <laughs> come on, settle down, mate. Settle down. Yeah, I don't think that's a release in 2021 song. That yeah. one, that's, uh, leave, that in, leave that in 84, that one. Yeah. Uh, what's your favourite place to run? Do you have, like, a favourite route? You, yeah. Roads, trails, what are um, you? Yeah, I, I tend to have my daily tempo. I'm, like, living in Cowie, so I just go down the hill, round, round the waterfront, Typically into an extremely blistering headwind. Ugh. Fuck, if you don't know Auckland, you won't know what I'm talking about, will yeah. you? Um, yeah, for anyone that's not from Auckland, probably sort of around Kelly Talton sort of way. Yeah, the waterfront. The yeah. waterfront, yeah. No, I'm a sucker for a view. Yeah, it's a great view along there. Yeah. I, I love running along there. There's um, there's water fountains, there's uh, toilets if you need them. Yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't know if we said this on the podcast, but I actually ran past one Dom Harvey uh, by Kelly Towers and didn't even fucking know it was I, me. I didn't make the connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then was Dom, you, Dom, Dom, I was like a fanboy. Yeah, now that you mention it, it was like, I, I do remember the encounter, but it's like, I, I still don't recognise it as being Mitch. Yeah, yeah probably. You were very excited. You probably would have expected a little fatso driving along. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, come on, come on. Um, what's your favourite shoe? Do you have a favourite shoe? Um, I definitely have a favourite shoe that's not a running shoe. Uh, uh, Nike Air Jordan 1 Low. Um Triple white, that's my go-to. But I, uh, with running shoes, I w- really want to try out the Kipchoge special, um, and I wish I did to shave off that extra 1% of oh, my time. Oh, mate, wait right there. Yeah? Wait right there. I'll be right Have back. you got some stats for me? Kanye. Hey, little girl, is your daddy home? Oh, shit, yeah, yeah. That's the Kip- Kipchoge show, and I'll tell you what... Mm. I reckon it's wow. probably worth, probably worth a, I don't know, maybe five seconds a kilometre. It is so, it feels so good. Really? It's been called like shoe doping. It's, yeah, uh, mechanical doping, they said, hey, yeah. Man, it, just the spring it gives you, it's phenomenal. I just, I save them for special occasions. They're my really Kipchoge well. shoes, yeah. But uh, wow. yeah, worthwhile investment. And how much do those set you back? Oh, like a few hundred. Yeah. Look at that shit, hey, so lightweight. Fucking hell. Man, it's so good. It's next yeah. level. But I think I'm just running some um, Essex at the moment. Yeah. I went to one of those shoe science places and ran for the dude like an idiot, you know. And <laughs> On the little shit. treadmill. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. Yeah. I, I say that to anyone. It's like um, running such a cheap sport. Mm. Um, the only investment you need to make is shoes. So you go yeah. do it properly. Go to like shoe science or shoe clinic or somewhere like that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, do you prefer to run alone or with a crew? 
Alone. Yeah. Yeah, alone for sure. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm the same. I feel like if you're running with a crew, someone's always running slower than what they want to and someone's running faster than they want to. Absolutely. And, like, I feel like there's always – Maybe maybe I'm wrong and maybe I'd be that person, but I feel like there's always one person to try and talk too much as well. It's like, bro, shut the fuck up. We're trying to run. Yeah. Yeah. Some, like, yeah. bullshit chat about the weather or something. Hey, shut I, up, bro. Yeah, I've got mates like that. And I just, like, grunt along. I'm not, I'm not, off, yeah, I'm not I'm, bringing anything to the yeah, conversation. 100%. 100%. Um, do you prefer um, hot or cold, summer or winter? For running. For running. Colder the better. Yeah. Colder the better. Yeah, I, my girlfriends will uh, vouch for that. <laughs> I'm a very sweaty man generally, so uh, anything cold is is beautiful. Like I, I actually really enjoyed that first half of the Auckland one just because it was so early and oh, before sunrise. Yeah, yeah. Oh fuck, it was like it was magic, eh? But yeah, I can do the hot like, but it's just unnecessary mental challenge. Yeah. Eh? Oh, something I've asked everyone. I'm, oh, I'm going to ask you as well, but I feel like we already know the answer. Runners high is it real or a myth? Well, I mean, you are uh, high. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no comment. No, te- technically, runners high all the time. Um, no, definitely, it's a, it's definitely a thing. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely. A thing. I, I I agree, it's, and it doesn't always happen necessarily when you run. But it's, you know, sometimes yeah. you you finish that run, flick your shoes off, be in the shower, and you just feel good. Yeah, and super high. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, no, um, totally, Mitch. Thanks for sitting down today. Um, and pleasure, um, yeah, good good luck finding um, the love that you deserve. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you re- it. You really do. You've got a you've got a big heart, massive Thank heart, you, and a lot so to give. So do you. So do you. And um, no, I'm I'm really excited for for you, and I'm I'm so super stoked to help out. So let me know if uh, if I can help out in any way, bro. And uh, always a pleasure, bro. Appreciate it, Mitch James. Love, love you. Bro. you.